is looking at the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, or some people say Habakkuk. Uh, you can decide which you prefer. And uh, please do turn it up in your Bibles. It's not the easiest book to find because it's quite short and it's buried amongst those other short Old Testament prophetic books near the end of the Old Testament. So the easiest way to get it is to start at the end of the Old Testament with Malachi and work backwards. And it's about five books from the end of the Old Testament. Uh, it's not going to be on the screen this morning, so I'd really encourage you to have it in front of you, either in a in book form uh, or on a, a screen or something like that. That would be great. And we're going to be looking at Habakkuk 1. Uh, hopefully most of you have already seen the pre-video that I sent out with the email this week, where I mainly looked at verse 1, uh, the prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received, or more literally, the burden that Habakkuk the prophet was shown. And uh, I, I reflected in that introductory video how this was a, a burden which Habakkuk, who was a prophet living in the dying days of Judah before the, the exile into Babylon around 600 BC, that he was given. Uh, it was the time probably when Jehoiakim was king of Judah, and he was a king who we read in the books of Kings and Chronicles in the Old Testament. He was a king who did evil and detestable things in the eyes of God. He brought idols and all kinds of um, uh, corruption and violence into the land. So it was not a good time. And Habakkuk was speaking into those days. So let's begin by reading verses two to four. I'll read them to you. Um, and Habakkuk says, and this in my Bible is titled Habakkuk's Complaints. And it's the first of uh, at least two complaints he made. As I was saying in the introductory video, um, we're eavesdropping really unusually in the Bible on a, in a conversation between the prophet and God. So this is Habakkuk's first statement to God, his complaint. How long, Lord, must I call for help? but you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Well, he's making some quite strong accusations, isn't he? And he's asking God some, some serious questions. Why and how long? And a whole series of, of problems he brings to God, perhaps most prominent in them is the word violence, which occurs twice in those verses I've read and another four times in the verses that are to come. Violence. And we also see words like injustice, and wrongdoing, and destruction, and strife, and conflict. And it seems that the rule of law has become lax. People can no longer rely on the law giving them justice. Justice is denied and perverted. The wicked, it seems, have the upper hand over the righteous. Living a good life does not get you anywhere in this society. You have to be corrupt and powerful and violent to get anywhere. And this is in Judah. This, these are the, the God's people, the Jews, who are supposed to be his, his servants, who are supposed to be a witness and a light to the nations. And this is what's going on in their country. And, and um, Habakkuk is saying to God, why and how long, Lord, are you going to carry on allowing this to happen? So two big questions. Why and how long? God does not seem to be listening. Why do you not listen? Habakkuk says to God. He seems to be tolerating injustice rather than saving his people from it. He needs to be doing more. Habakkuk is saying you need to be doing more, God. And we might think we might feel a bit surprised at finding words quite this forceful in the Bible, though I don't think they're that untypical of the prophets and the wisdom literature, particularly in the Old Testament. And I think we're encouraged to express ourselves in words like these, to feel like this. And, and probably many of us do feel like this when we look at the world around us. We look at the way in which the coronavirus, but also global warning, have impacted those who are most vulnerable, both in our country and worldwide. We see that living an honest, upright life does not protect you against these things. 
We see communities which are downtrodden and persecuted because of their skin color, because of their caste or tribe, because of their religious faith. We see people, mainly women and children, although not only them, subjected to violence and abuse, even in their own homes where they should be safest. And as we look around our world, as we read our newspapers and look at the internet, surely it's only natural that we, like Habakkuk, could, should cry out to God, why? How long, Lord, are you going to allow this to happen? Now, let me sort of digress slightly for a moment and talk about the word spirituality. Now, the word spirituality is used a lot nowadays. If you try Googling it, don't do it now, but you can try it later. You'll probably come up with images of, um, I don't know, piles of pebbles on a beach somewhere or next to a lake. Um, all looking very peaceful and perhaps a person sitting uh, preferably cross-legged with their arms gently extended maybe in front of pile of said pebbles or something else equally relaxing and spirituality we are led to understand means getting in touch with ourselves uh, relaxing um, in some ways cutting ourselves off with everything that's going on around us and there is a time and a place for all that sort of stuff. I'm a great believer in getting into the countryside and getting a perspective on things, but that's not really a biblical perspective on what spirituality is. Spirituality itself is not a word that we find in the Bible, but the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit. And Christian spirituality means being in touch with, being filled with, being in step with the Holy Spirit of God. And the Bible paints a picture for us of spiritual people as those who are in touch with God, who are in step with his spirit, who are soaked in the scriptures which God has breathed out to us, who are enabled by the spirit to communicate to God, even to communicate the kind of words that Habakkuk has been saying in this passage, which we might be saying, which we might think doesn't really chime with modern ideas of spirituality, having a rant at God. And yet this is a spirituality we find in the Bible. Habakkuk is doing something very spiritual, something that is found in the Psalms and the prophets a lot. He is complaining, he is lamenting, he is questioning, but he's not doing that thing to himself and he's not putting that out there on social media he's doing it to God and that's what true spirituality looks like first of all when things are bad and we're feeling confused and frustrated a good place the good place to start is by bringing those things to the Lord so I'm not dismissing relaxation techniques and so on no doubt they have their place but remember that Habakkuk, that God gave Habakkuk a burden. He didn't say just, just chill Habakkuk, don't worry too much about everything that's going on around you. He gave Habakkuk a burden about what was going on about him. And the spiritual thing for Habakkuk to do was not to, to chill out and forget about that burden and forget all the injustice, but to engage with God about it. That was what the right thing for him to do was. And so um, I think the book of Habakkuk encourages us to ask ourselves, well, what burden is God giving us? And you might think, well, I, I don't need to go looking for burdens. I've got plenty already on my shoulders. And that may be true. And I'm sure all of us, of course, feel a sense of being burdened at the moment. But what are the things that God is placing on us, not just about ourselves, but around the world, about the world around us, that he wants us to, to feel a burden about, that he wants us to burn with, with indignation and frustration about. What are the pains and failings and injustices which make you angry, which make you want to scream to God, why? How long, Lord? And if you never pray that kind of prayer to God, I encourage you to do so, because it's a spiritual prayer to pray. What are we going to do with these burdens that we feel? Biblical react spirituality means taking them to God and then waiting on God. Jesus, of course, famously said in Matthew chapter 13 to those who were feeling weary and burdened, he said, come to me, take my yoke 
upon you and learn from me. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus didn't say there's not going to be any burdens. He says, I'm going to help you bear your burdens. Not by ignoring them or bearing them or casting them off, but by taking, allowing me to, to share that yoke with you. So Jesus, too, in the New Testament, encourages us to talk to God, to bring our, our problems, our burdens, our frustrations to him with an expectation that he's going to do something about it, that he's going to help to bear those burdens and that he's able to transform. Now, before we go in, uh, on in Habakkuk, I just want to say one other thing, just to be clear. Um, I hope there's no one in the congregation this morning who's affected by this, but I want to say it just in case there is. If you are someone who is experiencing violence or abuse yourself, uh, perhaps within your own home, from somebody you know and is very close to you, the Bible and the book of Habakkuk is not telling you just to pray harder and to suffer in silence. The spiritual thing to do in that situation is to seek help. So I just want to clarify that. Um, Habakkuk is talking about the bigger burdens of society, but if you are being um, subjected to domestic violence or abuse, please do not suffer in silence. Please talk to me or to Steph or to someone you trust, and please do find help. So let's move on now in Habakkuk and let's look at the response which God gives Habakkuk starting at verse five, in verse five of Habakkuk one. So imagine that you have gone to God with a big, ver a big burden. Maybe it's maybe you're someone who's who's been given the burden of, of climate change, of global warming, of the way we're so badly treating the environment around us and the mess we're making of it. Or maybe it's the oppression of minorities. That is the burden that's on your heart. Maybe it's war ravaged communities in Syria and Yemen. Maybe it's minorities. Maybe it's Christians who are being persecuted for their faith. Maybe there is a big burden that's being placed on your heart and you are angry about the injustice. Well, here's the good news that Habakkuk encounters. First of all, God responds. And he doesn't always seem to respond to us so clearly, does he, or so immediately. Um, but here he responds in verse five. And God says to Habakkuk, look, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. What a wonderful, what wonderful words of promise. God is on the case. He sees and he's going to do something about it. And it's worth just pausing there and, and noting actually how this verse is quoted by the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 13 to emphasize how radical and how global the gospel is and to perhaps challenge us about whether our expectations of God are too small. If you're somebody whose prayers don't really go much beyond you and your immediate family, or even worse, you know, whether you're going to get a parking space or find a trolley, you know, I hear people pray about those sort of things. But it, there's a temptation that we pray, particularly in these times of coronavirus, we become very obsessed with ourselves and our own circumstances. Let's remember that God is someone who, who is interested in those things, but is interested and is, is loves to hear our prayers for global and big and huge, big, scary issues as well that we might just feel are beyond our ability even to imagine. So that's the good news. But then God says something to Habakkuk very troubling. He says at the beginning of verse six, I am raising up the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. Now, at the point in which he said this, the Babylonians were only just coming into prominence, but they were going to be, they were becoming the new superpower. And they were becoming the new superpower through brute force. And so that a parallel today might be to say, well, well, we, we cry to God for injustice in our world. And if it and it's, if it, it, it's as if our, God's answer to us is, well, you're all going to be invaded by Xi Jinping's China or, or there's going to be a global pandemic or a cyber crisis or a wage, a wave of sickness, which is going to overwhelm your community. It's going to be something that is just seems like the, the opposite of what. Um, Habakkuk would have expected or would have wanted to happen. 
And, and God doesn't even pretend it's going to be a nice experience. Let me read the rest of God's answer, um, starting from verse uh, six. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping to devour. They all come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities by building earthen ramps that capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. God's not, pre God's not pretending to Habakkuk in any way that th these are nice people, that these are in any sense uh, good people and it's going to be a pleasant experience. They are, they're guilty people whose own strength is their God. It's, it's an awful situation. Now, I don't really have time to unpack those verses I've just read, but I think the overall sense is clear, isn't it? And we just need to let that sink in for a minute. It's as if God's saying to us, in, in response to our heartfelt pleas about all the injustice and violence in our world, he's saying to us, I am at work already, but not in the way you think. And implicitly, he's saying to us, you've got to trust me here, for I am going to bring good out of this, even though it might just seem disastrous. So let's see how Habakkuk responds, because we now come to what my Bible entitles Habakkuk's second complaint. And Habakkuk is absolutely horrified. The cure, as far as he's concerned, that God has just outlined is far worse than the disease. God has gone way overboard. This is all wrong. But it also gives us another insight into Habakkuk's spirituality. Because when everything we know and trust and expect is thrown up in the air, there are two ways to go. There are two ways to respond when our lives are thrown into turmoil. The first way is to reinterpret God in the light of our extent, in the light of events and experiences. And the second way is to seek to reinterpret the events and experiences in the light of God. And Habakkuk does the second of those things. He doesn't immediately assume, OK, this is the reality. I need to reinvent my idea of God uh, and what I've just heard. Well, maybe that wasn't God at all. He doesn't do go that way. He says the thing I know to be absolutely sure and certain is God. And therefore, I need God's help to see what is going on around me with his eyes. So he begins with God. Look at verses 12 and 13. Lord, he says, Lord, this is Yahweh. This is my Bible is Lord in capital letters. This is the personal holy name for God revealed at the burning bush to Moses. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my holy one, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. You see what Habakkuk does? He goes to God and he says to God, but he's also saying to himself those things he knows to be true about God. And there's a, you know, there's a whole sermon in that verse. What do we see about God? He's eternal. He's not just here today and gone tomorrow. He is from everlasting. He is holy. He is beyond us. He's beyond our understanding and our ability to grasp. He is sovereign. He is in charge. He is pure. We might think that we know what is right and wrong, but God is the pure one who knows right from wrong, and he is a just God. And the other beautiful thing about that prayer that Habakkuk says in verses 12 and 13, it's a deeply personal prayer. As I say, he, he addresses God using his personal name, Yahweh, but he also describes him as my God, the God I know, my Holy One. Quite bold, actually, to address the Holy One as my Holy One, my rock. 
the one, the one I know to be the solid place where I can put my feet. So he affirms to God what he knows of God. He is in, a, in effect worshipping, but he's also preaching to himself, which is a very, very good habit, particularly when bad things are happening all around us. One of the best things we can do is to speak truths to ourselves and to remind ourselves what kind of God we worship and what he has revealed about himself. And that's what Habakkuk does. He's completely disorientated and disillusioned here, and yet he goes to God and he talks to God about the kind of God he knows him to be. He's expressing something which C.S. Lewis called an obstinacy in belief. Uh, C.S. Lewis said that once you've come to believe something, then you're gonna find your beliefs get, get um, shaken by all kinds of events and circumstances and it's right to have a certain obstinacy to say I'm going to hold on to this no matter what gets thrown at me. A determination to hold on based on what we know of God and a willingness to wait for God to reveal the significance of the burden that he has placed on us. But Habakkuk then carries on and he repeats his why, his words of lament in the second part of verse 13. So he's, he's said these things to God, but he then he carries on expressing what's on his heart. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous, treacherous? If you're this holy, majestic, righteous God, why do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? And then in the, the remaining few verses of this chapter, he re-expresses his views in a, in a sort of poem, really, of, a little poem about fish, which might seem slightly random to us. But uh, let me read it to you. Uh, Habakkuk says to God, you have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net, he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? So Habakkuk's saying to God, it's as if we, your people, we're just like fish in the sea. We just, we're defenseless. We're just waiting to be, to be caught in nets and with hooks. And there's Babylon there with his great trawlers and fishing fleet. And he's just going to gobble us all up. And we just feel so helpless. And perhaps there's a slightly grisly sort of um, uh, echo there of the way in which in those days when you captured prisoners in war, you'd, you'd put hooks through their lips and you'd drag them off. Um, all sort of linked up together in a very unpleasant way. And Habakkuk is perhaps drawing on that imagery, saying we just feel like, you know, Tiddler's in the sea and there's this great army and he's going to gobble us all up. And, and Lord, what are you going to do about it? And that's Habakkuk chapter one. And we have to wait. We have to wait for more of God's answer. And uh, we're looking forward to having you and Menzies with us next week, who's going to look at Habakkuk chapter two. It's a good question as to whether the, the chapter breaks are in the right places here. By the way, the chapter breaks in the Bible are not original. They were put in in the Middle Ages. So don't get too worried um, about where they are. Um, but possibly two verse one should be in chapter one. But I'm going to leave it with you and next week to talk about that as well. But except I'm just going to read it. And I'm going to suggest to us that for the next week, in a sense, we are to inhabit we are to inhabit ugh, we are to inhabit Habakkuk chapter two, verse one, which says, I, Habakkuk, will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he, that's God, will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. I'm going to wait now and see what God says and what God does, is what Habakkuk says. So we're going to have to do that for the next week, and um, perhaps I'm afraid for longer in respect of the burdens that God places on us. But just to conclude this morning, I want to suggest, I suppose, two, two themes that come out of this chapter. Firstly, the burdens that are laid upon us, the burdens we feel for what's going on around us, they, they may be God-given burdens. They may be things that God has placed on our hearts, which he wants us to feel burdened with. 
not to feel completely overwhelmed with, and he wants to share those burdens with us, as we've reminded of ourselves. But when we read the newspapers and we look on social media, we're supposed to feel a reaction. We're supposed to feel burdened by what's going on in the world. And we're supposed to beware quick, simple, cheap answers to it. We're supposed to wrestle and lament and talk to God about it. That might not seem like a, a good news message this morning, but I think that is the reality of what true biblical spirituality means. It means accepting that burden, accepting the burden God wants to share with us and wants us to share back with him. But the second lesson this morning, which I hope is a more positive lesson, is that true spirituality is, is God focused. And, and always we need to make sure that in our feelings, in our senses of burden, in our frustration, in our pain, we're constantly turning our eyes upwards and reminding ourselves the kind of God we worship, allowing the things that get us down to be seen through the lens of who he is. And we don't use all the things that are going on in our lives to be the lens through which we look at God. We look at God through the lens of what he has revealed to us about himself. And then we seek to reinterpret everything around us in the light of that, rather than doing the opposite and thinking the ultimate reality is the stuff that we're going through and somehow God needs to be found room in that. So may I encourage you particularly this week to see, to think how is God encouraging me to reorientate the way I look at the world based on how he sees it. And to perhaps reflect on that and then, as Habakkuk himself does in chapter 2, verse 1, to stand on the ramparts and look, to look into the distance and wait and see what God is going to do. Shall we pray? Lord God, we thank you for these books like Habakkuk, these little treasures in the Old Testament, which are not, they're not easy, easy answer books. They're books that encourage us to wrestle with you. They're books that encourage us to look at the world around us and be to be realistic about us, about it, but to see it in the light of who you are. And we thank you for those words of truth, which Habakkuk spoke to himself as well as to you and which come echoing down the ages to us. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. We thank you, Lord, that those words are true. And we pray that by the work of your Holy Spirit in our hearts, you will enable us to cling on to your truth and to see everything else in the light of who you are. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.